Welcome to the very last concept of the, or concepts of the Calc Path Geometry Summer Packet Review. Solving systems of equations. There are two ways that you have learned to solve system of equations or explored previously in middle school. The first one is solving by graphing, which will be our first learning target, the one that's covered also in this video, and also solving by substitution. There is another way that we will be learning in class called elimination. Before we start solving by graphing, we're going to review what it means to solve a system of linear equations. In solving a system of linear equations, what we're asking when we're asking to solve, we have two equations. Maybe they're in standard form, maybe one is in standard form, maybe one is in um, slope-intercept form. So here's slope-intercept form, here's standard form. And what we're doing is we're trying to solve this system, or when they're asking us to solve, we're trying to find the value of x and y, an ordered pair, a point, that will make both equations true. that makes both equations true. So that's our goal, right? When we solve an equation, if we plug the answer back in, it should make the equation, it should be balanced. The equation should be balanced. The numbers we found, the number we found for x should make the equation true. Same thing here, when we find our value of x and our value of y, if I plug them into this equation and this equation, the equation should still be balanced. What that means graphically or visually is that <clears throat> there's going to be a point where the two lines meet, possibly. So there's actually a couple different things. There's a possibility of having one solution when we're doing this with linear equations. There are other types of functions like quadratics and cubic functions and other things that you'll be learning later that will lead to more, possibly more than one solution. But in this case, we have two lines and there is a point, we've graphed them on the xy coordinate plane, and there is a point where they intersect. I'll call it x star, y star. There's infinitely many points on this line that are true for this line and its equation, but not true for this line and its equation, except for this point. The single point where the two lines intersect is the intersection point and the solution to both equations. Now, we're talking about lines. So, as you explored in middle school, lines don't always intersect. Sometimes, there's a symbol. This is a symbol that we use in geometry to show that the lines are parallel, an arrow on both lines. This is parallel lines. And if the lines are parallel, then there will be no solution often represented by this right here. It's the null symbol, which means no solution. So for linear equations or a system of linear equations, we have a maybe a real life situation or just some equations that are given that we know the equations are true and they don't, they're parallel. They will never intersect, then we're never going to find a solution that works for both of them at the same time. When they intersect, we'll be able to find that point that makes both of them true at the same time. That x-coordinate and y-coordinate, that is our solution point. It's also possible for us to have infinite, infinitely many solutions. That doesn't mean that every point in the coordinate plane is a solution, but that means that there are infinitely many, we can continue finding them, um, solutions to this. So for example, in the coordinate plane, I have this line that I graph, and I graphed its equation, and then I found another equation, maybe it was in a different form, and when I went to graph it, it ended up being the same line. What does that mean? That means that while a point out here on the, in the coordinate plane is not a solution to either equation, every point on the dark line and every point on the red line, every single point is a solution to both. So that would give us infinitely many solutions. 
what does this look like when we solve algebraically? So in this video, we're going to look at how to solve it graphically, so this will make sense. In the next video, we're going to look at how to solve it um, using substitution algebraically. So what it means when we solve this is that I end up solving and I get a number for x and a number for y that are true for both equations. One number for x, one number for y, true for both equations. This is what happens when we solve algebraically. We'll get that number, we plug it in, it works. We're happy, we're confident we did it right. When it gets no solutions, you can see that when you graph it, because they have the same slope, but different y-intercepts. But when solving, it gets a little confusing because, and you'll see that when we go to do it, that you'll get something like, hey, our, our variables might cancel out, or what, when we're solving, not cancel, but they disappear in the solving process, and we're left with something like 2 equals 5, which is not a true statement. And therefore, what that means is that there will never be a number for x or for y that will be true for these two equations. So this is where we'd say no solution. In the infinitely many solutions case, again the variables will undo each other in the solving process and you'll be left with an equation that has no variables. Except this time, instead of having two numbers that aren't equal saying that they're equal, which is untrue, you'll have something like 2 equals 2, or 5 equals 5, or 0 equals 0, or possibly even um, x equals x, which again would lead you to 0 equals 0. So since all of these statements are true, what that means is that there are infinitely many solutions. You can pick a certain number for any number you want for x. There will be a y, maybe we don't know what it is, but there will be a height that matches that x that will be true for both equations. So let's get to graphing as we try to solve these systems of equations by graphing. So if you haven't already, please make sure you go back and watch the video on how to graph both what y slope intercept and using the x and y intercepts. For this first function, we're going to start, this is a slope of negative 1 and a y-intercept of 4. So starting at a y-intercept of 4, I go down 1, right 1, down 1, right 1. I continue this across the entire graph because I don't know where the intersection point is and I want to make sure all of my points are accurately plotted. And then I reverse that by going up 1, left 1. And so that's our slope of negative 1, our y-intercept of positive 4. And I connect those points. Now I tend to do this in two different colors. Um, it might help you, because then you can see which equation was, came, which, where your work came from as you graphed these, when you go to check your answers. For here, our slope is negative 3 fifths for this bottom equation, and the y-intercept is 2. So starting at positive 2, I need to go down 1, 2, 3, and over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hey, there's our intersection point. Down 1, 2, 3, and over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, if I hadn't found my point of intersection here, then I would reverse the slope going up 1, 2, 3, and back 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and I would repeat this process. But I have enough points, I have an accurate intersection point, so I'm just going to connect those points, usually with a ruler or a straight edge. And I have my equations graphed, and I have the solution right here at 5, negative 1. Now, to verify that that is correct, that I didn't plug, that I didn't somehow graph wrong and end up with the incorrect solution, I'm going to plug this in. It should make this equation and this equation true. So, negative 1 is my y equals the opposite of x, by the way, I should probably put those in parentheses, plus 4. Well, negative 1 equals negative 5 plus 4. That is true. So, so far, the solution works. For this equation, does the, uh, does 1, or that's negative 1, yeah, does negative 1, that should have been in there, equal the opposite of 3 fifths times 
5 plus 2. Well, negative 3 fifths times 5, this is 5 over 1, those will cancel, or you'll have negative 15 over 5, which is negative 3. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. So this is a solution to both equations. We found it by graphing. We verified it by plugging it in. For the next problem, those are in standard form, so I'm going to use cover-up method. I'm going to find my x and y intercepts. When I cover up the y, making it 0, x equals negative 3. When I cover up the x, making it 0, divide by negative 1, y is 3. So, for this line, I have negative 3 for my x-intercept and 3 for my y-intercept. I might want their slope. I can find the slope. It is up 3, right 3, so I could continue that pattern, up 3, right 3. It also is just 1 over 1, so I could do that as well. Down 3, left 3. Uh, I don't think I went left 3. There's left 3. Down 3, left 1, 2, 3. There we go. So here is this line. It actually has a slope of 1. You could change it to slope-intercept form if you want. For the next one, when I cover up this and to get the x-intercept, plugging 0 in for y, negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. Hey, there's the solution. When I cover up the x to find the y-intercept, divide by 3, I get 0, negative 2. Because I already have my solution, I'm not going to worry about following the slope, but if I didn't have it, then I would follow the slope of down 2, right 3, down 2, right 3, and continue that and possibly even reverse it to get additional points. So we have our solution at negative 3, 0 is what we believe our solution to be. We're going to plug that into both equations to make sure. So we have negative 3 minus 0 equals negative 3, correct. Negative 6 plus 0 equals negative 6. That works as well. Please pause the video and take a moment to try the bottom two problems. Welcome back. So for letter A, you should have started at negative 3 and followed a slope of up 1 over 2, giving you this graph, or down 1 back 2. giving you this line. For the one underneath, you would have needed to find the x and y intercepts or put it in slope intercept form. We have a little problem in that it goes to 11. I'm just going to put an extra mark there for 11. The y intercept, <clears throat> 0, 11. <clears throat> the x intercept is a decimal value, so I'm actually going to change this to slope intercept form. y equals negative 3x plus 11 by subtracting the 3x to both sides. So that means from this 11, I go down 1, 2, 3, and over 1. 1, 2, 3, over 1. 1, 2, 3, over 1. 1, 2, 3, over 1. There's our solution at 4, negative 1. But I'm going to go a little past that. 1, 2, 3, over 1. 1, 2, 3, over 1. And connect my points. I verify this by plugging in negative 1 equals half of 4, which is 2 minus 3. 2 minus 3 is negative 1, so that's correct. 3 times 4 is 12, plus negative 1 is 11, so that's correct as well. Letter B, y equals x. This has a y-intercept of 0, so x plus 0, and the slope of 1. So I follow that slope of 1 and plot all my points and go in the reverse direction, down 1, left 1, or up 1, right 1. And now for the standard form, uh, 15 is not going to go in evenly. I could do that, but I think I'm going to change this to slope-intercept form. You could do this. The x-intercept will be 5, and then the y-intercept will be 15 halves which is 7.5, but it's going to be a little difficult to figure out where they intersect here. So I'm going to change this to slope-intercept form by subtracting 3x from both sides and dividing everything by 2. y equals negative 3 halves x 
uh, that's still difficult. But we have this point down here, the x-intercept of 5. So if I still have the correct slope, negative 3 halves x, then I can go down 1, 2, 3, and over 2, or I can reverse that going up 1, 2, 3, and back 2. And there's our intersection point right there at 3, 3. But we at least have, we know that it's accurate from the slope that we found. We're going to check that by plugging it in. Does, when y equals 3, does x equal 3? Yes. When x equals 3, 3 by 3 is 9, plus 2 by 3 is 6, and 9 plus 6 is 15. So we know we have the correct intersection point, the correct solution to both equations. Don't forget to watch the video on solving by substitution.